Today's show is sponsored by Earth Friendly Products. For over 40 years, Earth Friendly Products have brought you the greenest home products for all your family needs. Learn more at ecos.com. That's ecos.com. Now let's get to the show. What's your thoughts on government cover-ups or covert societies attempting to control humanity? Do you believe in ancient astronauts, intergalactic communication, or extraterrestrial visitations? Ever had an experience with disembodied spirits or the paranormal universe? Are these subjects fact or fiction? Each week, Tony and Eddie explore these unbelievable realities and beyond. Exclusively on Truth Be Told. Hello and welcome to Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. I'm your host, Tony Sweet. And I'm Eddie Connor. Welcome, everybody. As a lot of you may know, because Tony's been talking about it a lot, I appreciate it, Tony. I'm taking a spiritual group to Peru this May. And of course, we couldn't wait to invite author and adventurer Brian Forrester back to share Peru's cultural and history. That's right. His study of the Inca culture inspired his book, A Brief History of the Incas. And through his years of research, we are going to talk specifically today about the Nazca Lines. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Nazca Lines are located in southern Peru. They're a group of pre-Columbian geoglyphs etched into the desert sands. Now, a lot of them are covering an area of nearly 1,000 square kilometers. And Tony, there are over 300 different figures located there. So here's the question. What are they? Who created them? And why are they only visible from the sky? And uh, throughout the interview, I'm going to be showing our audience pictures of the NASCAR lines, and we hope you enjoy them. That's right, especially if you're on iTunes and iHeartRadio, right? Beautiful. Our guest, Brian Forrester, is the leading expert in the ancient sites of Peru, and we are absolutely honored to have him here today. So everybody, please put your hands together and welcome Brian Forrester. Welcome back, Brian. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Well, we are so excited, and and, uh, this time around, you get to see Eddie and I, because last time we could just see your handsome face. So we're excited to have you here and uh, talk about, but well, first of all, First of all, before we talk about the Nazca Lions, I want to find out what's been going on in your world because you're always up to something down there in Peru and finding new discoveries. So could you kind of update us on what's going on uh, and anything that you've been working on? Well, I've been working on a lot of things. Of course, one of my major focuses are the elongated skulls of Peru. So I recently published a book. Uh, showing where all of the ancient elongated skulls existed in both Peru and Bolivia. Uh, We've been traveling extensively, just got back from Cusco. We're actually in in Paracas right now, which is about four hours drive from Nazca. So we've been exploring this area and um, always finding new things to study, write about, and share. Well, one thing I I find fascinating about you that a lot of people want to like Eddie is going in May to do a tour but this is this is your life this is something that you've dedicated your life at doing and and when you wake up every day wherever you're at in Peru or an, an ancient site what what is that feeling what is that feeling like to to wake up like that is it is it a fulfillment that uh, that just needs to keep going and going and going yeah, I feel very blessed with being able to do this, um, and there is so much to explore. There's so much that conventional archaeology doesn't or can't explain, and so it's kind of my job, along with others, to decode some of this stuff, such as, you know, the Nazca lines and geoglyphs, who made them, um, etc. cetera. Um, and so Peru by itself is a giant archaeological site, and there's so many places to explore and learn new things, especially from local people. Right. So your first time, when, when was your first time to actually step foot on, on uh, any type of Peru ancient site? When was the first time that, that happened for you? Uh, Ten years ago. Oh, is that all? Almost 11. Wow, wow. it seems like it, for all the research and stuff you've done, it seems like it's been... 20 years. Yeah, 20, 25 years of work. Wow, you've done a lot in those 10 years. 
Well, before that, I was studying Polynesia. Uh, prior to that, um, I was a professional totem pole carver. So I've been involved with Indigenous um, studies and people all of my life. Okay. Well, one thing, we wanted you to come back because we never really got in depth about the NASCAR lines. And, and I've never been to Peru. Eddie's been there, what, three times? Uh, yes. Three times. Four. So, four times. So I, I can't wait to go, but I've always heard about the, the lines itself. And when you look at them, they're such an amazing feat for anybody that uh especially back in that those times before there were even aircraft yeah on before the earth plane. right so can we start with when the nazca lines were discovered not necessarily by peruvians and and that sort but people from the outside world that where it got recognition when did those when did it get discovered well actually the first person to recognize them was a Peruvian archaeologist who was doing a, a study or a dig on top of a nearby mountain and he looked down and he saw that there were these figures <clears throat> and then after that once aviation started uh, then of course um, pilots started to recognize that they were very extensive in size and it's been going on ever since. How old do they do you guys think they are? Well, we know to a great extent that they were probably started about 500 BC mm. and then ended about 580. So it was about over a thousand years. Uh, that, wow. That's that a long is time. remarkable. A long time ago. So, okay. And when, when, you, when you step into that er area, uh, of, and what, where is it exactly is it located again? Um, it's about eight hours drive south of Lima, the capital. Okay. Um, and, and four hours from Paracas, which is where I am right now. When, when you step into that area, is, is, is there like a different type of a energy or, or spiritual connection that you feel and that others feel when they are in that uh, area itself? Yeah, definitely. That's why my wife and I uh, live here. Oh. <clears throat> there's, a real, uh, tr there's a real tranquil feeling about the area, and it is extreme desert um, with some agriculture, but then you have the ocean right next to it, so it's a, it's a really breathtaking landscape uh, to see. In some areas, you don't even see a blade of grass or a cactus grow. It's that dry. Really? Okay. So when, when you started doing your research, what is the natives? What, do they know exactly who made these, or is it more guess, guessing who made these? Or the legends. Or what the did, legends, yeah, yeah, what the, the legends. The storytelling. Yeah, that's a great one, yeah. Yeah, well, the unfortunate thing is that the, uh, the Nazca people themselves uh, disappeared about 600 A.D. <laughs> because of desert, uh, desertification of the area which started about 600 years before that. And so they were forced to abandon uh, the entire area and move into the highlands of Peru. And then later cultures moved down in succession and took over. But it was, uh, it was lack of rainfall that really caused the downfall of the Nazca culture. So how, how does something like this, if that was, what, 600 A.D., and we're at 20... 2100 AD now, how does something like this stay? How is it not eroded where many things have been eroded uh, here? I know here in the U.S. even just a couple hundred years. How does it, uh, how does it preserve? Well, shoot, just buildings that were built in the 80s fall down <laughs> right. here. That's true. Well, actually, it's because there isn't um, excessive winds blowing. And because Nazca only gets about half an inch of rain a year, uh, they've been very well preserved. Also, they have been etched into the ground. Um, and since the population disappeared about 600 AD, there you know there have, haven't been that many people occupying the actual Nazca uh, line area since their um, collapse. Well, and just out of curiosity, because I'm bad at geography, how close are you to Lake Titicaca? Uh, Lake Titicaca is about 
I think 350 miles to the southeast. Okay. So that's up in the that's up in the highlands um, east of of Nazca. Nazca is very flat, yeah. and again, it's very close to the ocean. It's only a couple of hundred feet above sea level. But then, when you travel to the east, you get into the foothills of the Andes, and then into the uh, Andes themselves. Mm. And so, Brian, I'm curious. How do the locals there, uh, are they welcoming? Do they, I know they understand what you're doing because they're very intelligent, obviously, and, and they've got a lot of heart energy about them in my personal experience. How do you find that they welcome you whenever you're coming in and you're finding elongated skulls and you're doing deeper research into the Nazca lines and other things? Actually, the amazing thing is that they don't really pay attention because they're too busy taking care of their families and making a living. There's not a lot of um, of local interest in pre-Columbian history, which for me is a, actually a great advantage because that means I can travel anywhere I want, including massive ancient cemeteries, and nobody, not even the officials, bother to um, you know to do too much about that. So it's great to be able to explore freely. Wow. What kind of mystical experiences have you had when you're like doing your work through an ancient cemetery or you're on the top of Machu Picchu and you have a shamanic experience? What are some of the more mystical might be the wrong word for you, but what are some of the other otherworldly or mystical experiences that you've had doing this work? Well, I honestly feel that these ancient cultures want to be remembered. They want to be rediscovered um, and understood as to how great they were. <clears throat> and, you know, archaeology is fine, but in general, archaeologists tend to share their information with each other. And so what I prefer to do is to share all of my discoveries with anybody on the planet that wishes to follow what I do. I love that. And, and so, which leads me to this question i i like i love history i'm not a history buff like tony sweet is i like <laughs> aspects of it and then i can get really pissed off really quick about it so for example the genocide of the native americans in north america and or the way we brought uh african americans over from their home countries and mm -hmm. turned them into slaves here and then how we don't talk about that history here do you find that in your line of work there are aspects of history that you really feel driven to bring to the mass consciousness so that we can respect it, see it, and educate ourselves and learn from it? Well, definitely, and for example, that's why I wrote a book about, about Nazca, because there are so many different theories as to who made them, what they're for, so I took a, a long period of time and studied all of the different theories, which of course are in my book, and you do see actually a very logical uh, progression in terms of what they were for depending upon the time period and over the course of a thousand years the reason why they were made kept changing and changing over time well, did you notice that the style would change uh, along with it like for certain generations you could see a totally different um, way of doing the lines as opposed like in the very beginning, they're probably obviously a little bit more primitive, but as you move forward in decades and decades past, or even a century or so past, you can see a difference in the way they do what they do? Definitely. Actually, in terms of form, they're actually more interesting the older they are because they're much more playful and fanciful <laughs> and esoteric. Um, <laughs> as you get into the actual Nazca period, they become simpler, uh, you know, beautiful designs like the spider and the hummingbird are Nazca works, but it's the earlier work that was actually done by the Paracas people who had the elongated skulls that's very intriguing. So what is the most outrageous hypothesis you've ever heard in connection to the Nazca lines? Well, honestly, relating to what are called the runways. It's that uh, the runways were used by extraterrestrials for, you know, landing their craft on Earth. If you're able to tr uh, travel across the galaxy, <laughs> you hardly need a runway. Right. I thought <laughs> um, about that too. And so it's, it, it's, it's kind of, that's kind of the silliest theory, but 
the question is why are they made so that you can only see them from the sky and that's you know that's something that's taken a lot of study to be able to try to figure out and a, a, uh, again it depends on the the time frame and which of the two cultures whether the Paracas were involved who were first or the Nazca who were second hmm. Do you find that uh, the cultures had a direct connection to either astronomy, aspects of astrology, and obviously metaphysics in the spirit world back in that era, right? Yeah, actually some of the lines, um, you know, and these lines go on for miles and miles. Some of them were for things like the uh, solstices and equinoxes of the sun. Um, others were to follow uh, lunar alignments others even possibly for the rising and falling of stars uh, but that's only that's one aspect and that's more in the Nazca period do you find that they face in certain directions as if it's directing I don't think the the, the possible ships that are in the air do you think they that there's a obviously we know there's got to be a method to the madness and a rhyme to the reason about why the hummingbird would face east and then the the monkey would face north do you find that there's something with that or do you feel like that they just sort of put it there no i think they're all intentionally pointing um i do too either to lunar or, or solar um, aspects or possibly star aspects um, or even pointing, you know, in, to some degree they point uh, east and west, so they, some could be pointing to the mountains or pointing to the ocean. Mm. Uh, it's a very complex story, and that's why I had to write a book. <laughs> Good. And we're glad you did. And so the title of the book, is this the book that's a brief history of the Incas, or is it a different book? Decoding the Riddles, Riddle of the Lines? That's right. That's what. Yeah, I've actually written sixteen books so far. So that's wow. uh, my second to last was uh, decoding the riddle of the lines. That's amazing. And uh, most people, if you can go to Amazon and pick that up, if you want to purchase that. Uh, I want to ask a, a little bit about the because there's there's one that. Uh, I'm going to show the picture right now for the people that are watching the video. One but of the Nazca lines. One of the Nazca lines, but it looks like a, either a human or it looks like what some call an alien-shaped uh, uh, line. So can, can you, or do you know anything about this or what the legend says about this one? Because, I mean, it does, if you look at what aliens we describe them as, it does look like an alien form. It does, and actually it's known by archaeologists that uh, that that one, which is called the Astronaut, um, and is at a 45 degree angle on the side of a mountain, hmm. is waving to someone in That's, the sky. And yeah. uh, it, it's known that the Paracas culture made that one probably right. about 500 B.C. 500 B.C., wow. What, why, do you, yeah. why do you think, well, I, I, you, you've helped me understand something. So when the Nazca people started to move out of that area of Peru, and I think you said they went to the foothills of the Andes, right? Right. And so I think you said it was about 500 A.D., no later than 600 A.D. They'd moved out of that area. Have we found any other uh, symbols, any remotely similar to those at all, Brian, in any other parts of South America or Peru or Ecuador or anywhere in the world? Not really. There are some, um, some lines and figures that have been found in the Brazilian Amazon as the result of, of deforestation, um, but nothing as extensive as the, uh, the Nazca system until actually you follow, when you follow the Nazca system into northern Chile, um, you wind up finding numerous other geoglyphs which are in the desert. Wow. Um, they're not, they weren't done by the same culture, but they are in relative proximity to Nazca. Mm. What would be some of the similarities in all of your research that you've seen, let's say with the Egyptians, the Incas, uh, different other cultures, even the Polynesian, what is something that's absolutely similar among them all, even though they may have never, ever been to any of those same parts of the world themselves? 
Well, you could say that each of the cultures were very sophisticated in, in terms of their spiritual aspects, um, in terms of their concept of as above, so below, as in connecting the sky with the earth, um, monitoring the movements of celestial bodies, and, uh, and that, that sort of thing. Um, that's a general relationship, you could say, about all of these people. I like that. It, it, so in today's modern times, were we supposed to be so dang smart and stuff? <laughs> um, what philosophy back then do you think we could employ today to make modern society even more connected, more grounded, and more of a community, Brian? Well, I think what's important about indigenous cultures in general is that the individual basically meant nothing, whereas in our culture, the individual means everything. And so uh, you, you would be a part of a family, which would be part of a tribal group, which would be part of a larger um, society, and you, you knew what your place was. Most people's position was regarded with respect, whether you were a farmer or you know the high chief or whatever, but, right. but people had this sense of cohesion that we've lost. Um, and that's quite, I think that's quite dangerous um, for people to be obsessed about themselves all the time mm -hmm. rather than seeing themselves as a small aspect of the greater whole. Wow. And well, of course, so. here in North America, we're the, we're the <laughs> empire we're of the <laughs> selfies <laughs> and the Mimi syndrome. And, and living in Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and living oh, in Los yeah. Angeles. Yeah. It's yeah. Even worse. <laughs> have you found a Nazca line for Kim Kardashian yet? Uh, we can have one made, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <for price>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm but, sure. You know, speaking of that, I, I don't remember exactly what it is just yet, but I remember... Um, our guide Abelardo was speaking to us about this, that there were really only three laws, like when we were in Cusco and um, up in Machu Picchu and Oliantaytumba and Agua Calientes and all of those areas. He said it is community driven and the three laws are directly connected to whether you're participating in the community or not. So if you're lazy, there was literally a law that if you were lazy, you could get, quote, locked up or put in a holding thing until you snapped out of it. You know what I mean? Do you know what those mm -hmm. laws are by chance, Brian, just off the cuff? Well, the thing is that uh, the way that most guides say, they say, don't, don't lie, don't steal, and don't be lazy. That's it. That's but it. in fact, the... But, but in fact, the Inca laws were not that way. The Inca laws were positive. Uh, the Inca laws were learn, be honest, and work hard. So positive rather than negative. And that's true. Those were the only, you know, three laws that people ha of the Inca world had to um, ob obey. No, no, I love what you just said for this reason. So let's go back to the ancient Incas. Were they speaking Quechua? Okay. And as we go back there, their philosophy is learn be honest and work hard now here's our interpretation of that don't steal bitches don't <laughs> lie and don't be lazy or you'll get your head chopped off isn't that funny how we interpret as we quote become more civilized yet we're really not a community anymore that's right. that's kind of heartbreaking yeah and that actually was the brilliance of the inca they they really um push the positive about everything. And the other thing about the Inca world is that the, the Inca themselves were only the, <clears throat> the, only the royal family. Um, and so the greater population were, were those that uh, the Inca took care of. Hmm. Wow. And so did you find uh, through what you've learned so far that there was an exchange of energy with the group of people that were taking care of the royal people as it were and vice versa yeah definitely and the important thing is that the high inca was not the equivalent of a king because that that term is european um you know the kings of europe basically owned the people owned the land whereas the high inca was the caretaker of the people so he had to make sure that everyone was happy in order for the society to prosper and that's why the general population tended to love the Inca family because they would they would always they had three guarantees every uh, member of the Inca world 
was given a house, a job, and food, no matter what. Wow. Now, is it is it well? We, like we're saying, it's different from the European uh, royalty, as we would say, king and queen. Uh, the high Inca was it passed down to family members, or was it also like uh, assigned or voted in, or how did how did they get to be the high Inca? It was always the first uh, the firstborn son, oh, okay, because it was important. It was important that. Um, that he learned everything that he needed to learn in order to be the caretaker of the people. So when he was about two years old, he had about 300 teachers oh, of wow. every possible discipline so that if he had to make a royal decision, you know, about engineering, about warfare, about agriculture, whatever, he, he was an expert by the time he took over the role from his father. Amazing. Well, it also sounds like they weren't just standing there saying, here's how you do it. Now run off. It's like he had, he got his hands dirty and he sweat and he got in there and really understood it from the inside out with these mentors. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. He would be, he would be given the final say for, so for example, if they came, if his engineers came to him and said, would like to build a bridge across this river because it'll connect these two major roads together, it'll improve commerce, the military will be able to move faster, etc. Then he would say, okay, well, how much material will this require? How many men will it take to build it? And women, um, you know, what's the total number of resources? And is that an efficient way to utilize our, uh, our resources? And uh, they would have to make an explanation as to, it'll use this much and this many people and take this long. And then he would make the final say as to, yes, this is worthwhile, or no, it's not worthwhile, for the benefit of the people. Well, you, you can tell you're, you're, you're bewitched by this culture as well. You have this wonderful heart affinity for it. So what was the very first moment where it literally just took over you? What, what were you doing the very moment it just took over you, Brian? Well, as soon as I landed in the city of Cusco, which was the Inca capital, there's just such a beautiful energy to that city. Yeah. Even, af even after 500 years of um, European persecution, that no matter what the, uh, the conquistadors or anybody else after them did to the native people of that area, you can't crush the spirit. So the mm. spirit is very much alive, and Cusco as a city knows what it is, knows what it represents and welcomes people on a very you know powerful energetic level everyone is welcome to come to Cusco and learn spiritual aspects because that's just the nature of the place well and you you truly can feel it I mean just flying in you I, I, the first time you I guys left, are just teasing I mean that's all you do no no it's, <laughs> it, 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 it's something it speaks to you to the core of your being every right. cell every molecule of your being this is the truth the first time I left Cusco and came home I'm not kidding I cried for a month I was so yeah. sad because the frequency is that pure there the mm. the hearts I, it, I literally a month the second time two weeks but now what I've learned that I can do because you know it takes me a minute Brian but I can get smart once I figure it out <laughs> it is all I have to do now is have conversations like this and I feel like I'm home again right I feel like I get to go play in that energy that you're beautifully articulating for us today about Peru well what we're gonna do well, is we're, thank you. what we're gonna do is we're gonna take just a, a little break and when we come back we have so much more to talk about because like I said Eddie's going on tour and the people out there that are listening like myself that have never been to Peru there's so much about it I, I do want to go. Don't. Uh, anyway, there's so much about it that I, I want to learn from you guys that have been there, done at, done that. But I also want to talk to you not about just the NASCAR lines, NASCAR lines, but the Palpa lines, which is not too far from NASCAR. So let's uh, let's take a quick break. We're talking to Brian Forster. He's an author, an adventurer, and you guys need to check out his website, HiddenIncaTours.com, and we're going to talk about some maybe the, if he's doing some tours. So, oh. Heck yeah. All right. So uh, this is Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. I'm Tony Sweet. I'm Eddie Connor. And we'll be right back. You suffer from anxiety, from depression, maybe even chronic pain. Well, listen up. Truth Be Told is going to tell you about a breakthrough program built on over 100 years of therapies used in America's returning veterans to help you successfully overcome PTSD, 
anxiety attacks, pain, and depression. The secret proven in study after study. Music therapy. The effects of music are nothing short of amazing. From strokes to PTSD, music has been shown to improve the quality of life. Now one of the latest music therapy programs being used in America's veteran hospitals can be yours to experience for free at home and to help your own anxiety attacks, pain, and depression. Or just relax after a hard day. It's called Whole Tones. It takes music therapy to a new level. This revolutionary program makes use of specifically designed frequencies that have been shown to stimulate your body's natural healing power down to a cellular level. If it works for battle scarred vets, can it work for you? Well, experience it for yourself for free at SweetWholeTones.com. Like Tony Sweet, that's S-W-E-E-T. Go to SweetWholeTones.com. Now enjoy the show. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. I'm Eddie Connor. And I'm Tony Sweet. And we're speaking with the extraordinary Brian Forrester, who's the author of 16 books. You can learn more about him at HiddenIncaTours.com. And Tony, just as we were going to break, you were asking about the Papa lines. And we want to ask you also, Brian, uh, a little bit about Machu Picchu, and we want to touch on the skulls before we let you go because... We're obviously in love with you, and we can't let you go without asking <laughs> about some of these things. All right, so let's talk, because the Papa lines are not too far from Nazca lines. And so were they built by the same people? Are they built in the same manner? And because uh, what I'm looking at, again, they're on the side of the mountain, so why did they make them separate and not just keep them in the same one same area? Well, that's a good, uh, a really good point, a good question. Actually, the whole system begins at Paracas, and there's one geoglyph that's 450 feet tall called the Candelabro, which is a, a trident shape, and it, uh, it's the beginning of the system. And then when you travel in a southeasterly direction, you encounter geoglyphs and lines as you go all the way through Palpa, which is in between uh, Paracas and Nazca, and then to Nazca itself. There are believed to be about a thousand geoglyphs in Palpa, and they're all in general on on the tops of mountains, uh, buttes, like they're they're flat top mountains, like you see in the southwest. Right. And that's where you that's where you definitely see spiral figures, um, half human, half insect characters, uh, and the majority of the so-called runways are located in Palpa. So when people visit Nazca and they fly over the Nazca lines, they don't pay the extra amount, which you can do, and fly over Palpa as well, which is actually far more complicated. Wow. I did, I, I've, all the times I've been there, I've never heard that. That's great information. Very, very. Wow. I'm, I'm showing, I was hoping that you could see it, and I thought you, you would see it. I was trying to switch it over so you can kind of explain what we're looking at. But I'm showing the runways. And it, are these, would they consider highways or, or thoroughways? Or what do you think these were? Because like you said, no, no alien spaceship's going to need a... Runway I know to to land on these. So what what do they think these are? are <laughs> Take they... a left at the Milky Way and look for the hummingbird. <laughs> right. Right. Um, well, actually, well, the, the intriguing thing is that they are on the tops of these flat mountains. So that's why they really look like they would be runways, and they're you know they're wider at one end and narrower at the other end. Um, you know, they're almost like um, spear point shapes. Hmm. Um, they point in different directions. I I think they're probably related maybe to solstices and equinoxes, but there are so many of them in Palpa. That's why uh, the next time you fly over Nazca, you have to include Palpa because you'll be rubbernecking, you know, left and right, looking out different windows because it's such a complex system. Oh, and most of that was made by the Paracas elongated skull culture hmm. between 500 BC and about 100 AD, maybe. Did you ever think, because I've seen you on Ancient Aliens, you've been on there quite a few times, and other, uh, other uh, probably History Channel and other uh, you know, sh TV shows, did you ever think that this would be your, like, what, what would you call it? Purpose. De purpose, destiny, to, to get the, the, the word out there about this amazing cultural discovery. Well, it is, it, yeah, this is my, my life's purpose, um, and it's been an evolution to get to this point, um, but what, you know, what really shocked me was 
was just um, when I went to Cusco and saw these amazing megalithic structures that I knew the Inca could not have made because in some instances, even 21st century technology can replicate them. So the question was, well, if the Inca didn't make them, who did? And we, you know, we have to go very distant into, uh, into history to even try to detect who possibly could have done it, much like Egypt, which you'll be discussing with Stephen Mailer. Right. Um, but it's because the official story, to some extent, I find silly that I've, um, you know, I work every day at this trying to unravel the mystery of who these people were, why they did this stuff. Um, and we're just so thankful that so much of this is, has been left uh, or has been passed down to us to, uh, to stop and un, you know, un, literally unravel. Whenever you speak about some of the huge structures and, and that sort of thing around Cusco, is part of what you're talking about sexy woman as an example? Yes, that, Oyente Tambo, and even the core of Machu Picchu is megalithic and now is known to be much older than the Inca. Wow, that's unbelievable. So if you were in an aircraft, spaceship or aircraft, if you were in an aircraft and you only got to visit one area of South America, I, I mean, one area of Peru, Brian, for one day, which area would you go to and why? The Sacred Valley. Yeah. <laughs> Be, because it's called the Sacred Valley. <laughs> Isn't that where they actually, the Incas, were at, uh, very successful at turning back some of the Spanish conquistadors? That's correct. Actually, at, at Oyente Tambo, that was the, that was their refuge when they had to abandon Cusco. They went to Oyente Tambo, which is um, a massive site, yes. and they were able they were able to hold off the Spanish for quite a long time until Manco Inca, who was the last of the true uh, high Incas, he had to then move deep in, into the the high jungle area, and, and he was able to evade. The Spanish for another 30 years. Wow. That's a long time. There is something about the Sacred Valley. It, there's an energy there that it's, it's all similar energy, but it's different. And whenever the first and second time I took a group there, we were all standing in some of the actual doorways going higher and higher up into the Sacred Valley. <laughs> and other groups were sort of coming in with picking their nose and scratching their butts. And we were standing there like with our arms out. It's like, can you feel this energy? Can you feel this energy? And the locals were like, yes, that is a vortex for da 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 da. And everybody thought we were so weird and kept walking <laughs> around like, Stay us. Stay away from them. But it, it's a legitimate, an invisible frequency or invisible energy is as real as any stone you can see there. And it's a remarkable thing to go and get to stand in that and feel the invisibility mm. of the physicality. Which is rare. You don't right. get to do that in many parts of the world. Not too many at all. So if we dropped you in Peru, the first place you would go was the Sacred Valley. <laughs> yeah. That's good information to have. So, yeah. Well, uh, a lot of the, uh, oh, sorry, but a, a lot of the most interesting ancient sites are in the Sacred Valley. Cusco, of course, is, is wonderful. But the Sacred Valley itself, also, it's just the climate there is, it's always springtime. Yeah. And there are always flowers, you know, blooming. And agriculture, you know, is produced there 12 months of the year. You know, it's called sacred because it's, it's such an incredible agricultural area. Then you have, you know, the great river that runs through that right. winds up um, emptying actually into the Amazon itself. It's, it's one of the tributaries of the Amazon. And so, yeah, it's like endless springtime in, in that area. It's just so it's beautiful. beautiful. It's beautiful. It, it's beautiful. It's peaceful. Did you ever read the Celestine Prophecy by James Redfield? Oh, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> what did you take away from that? Meaning, uh, we all took away certain things, but you, with your background and your expertise, I would love to know what you walked away from that book with. Well, I, I related completely with, with what he was talking about. Um, anybody who hasn't read that book should. Yeah. And then actually... Um, I think, it, didn't he write his second book? Yes, The Tenth yeah. Insight. That, the Tenth Insight. And actually, I, as soon as I bought that book, I flew to Hawaii the next day in order to get into the energy of, of Hawaii because I, I believe part of yeah of it was about that. But yeah, I'm, I've, I've been hooked into 
uh, my spiritual sense has been huge ever since I was born, I guess, and <laughs> yeah. I'm just so blessed blessed to be able to live in an, in an environment where even though the people themselves to a great extent are gone, you know, the great cultures are gone, but the energy of these places retain all of that information. And will as long as this earth is spinning in orbit. Yeah, I want to go back. I don't want to make this about James Redfield. I don't, and I'm not. Okay. But <laughs> it's like, all about you. It's all about you. It is. It is. Uh, so I'm curious about something. I didn't read the Tenth Insight. I don't know this thing about Hawaii that you're speaking about. But when I have gone to Hawaii, the three times I have gone, I feel the same similar energy in Hawaii that I felt in Peru. And those are the only two places on the world I've traveled to that feel that similar. And I had no idea that you, the 10th Insight was about Hawaii and you jumped on a plane. I tend to do that. <laughs> <laughs> So, and so why do, do you think about the vortex energy in Peru and in Hawaii? Because it's, it's loud and clear. Yeah, actually, well, the, the big similarity between Cusco, the Sacred Valley, and Hawaii is that they're major heart, you know, heart centers. Yeah. The, the people who live in the areas are, are much more heart-based than they are... Um, well, intellectually based, you know, if you could put it that way. So you, that's why there's a commonality. That's why people from anywhere on the planet can visit these places. And to a great extent, they're welcomed, not simply by the people, but by the energy. Because this is, hum, you know, these are places of ancient human energy. Mm. And so you're basically adopted as a, you know, as the long lost nephew when you up in these places because they're places for humans. Right. Wow, and, and and we get to get back in touch with what we're so far away from now, which is Amen. sad where we're at in North yeah. America, in my opinion. Well, we have about about six minutes left, and I can't believe how fast this hour has gone. But we want to talk a little bit about the uh, the skulls because this is one another one of your expertise, and there is a tie-in to what we're talking about today. And uh, could you give us a little bit more about how the how it works or how it worked together, or, wor or wh what significance that the the the, the skulls are, and not just their uh, their culture down there, but with our culture up here too. <clears throat> well, the um, the intriguing thing about the Paracas skulls are that they are the largest human skulls that have ever been found, and they are literally cone head shaped. Um, and, and um, you know, if you look up on the internet and you just, you know, you put in Paracas skull, you'll see some extraordinary things that look very much like they're alien or extraterrestrial or, or something. Right. Uh, and that's, that's why I'm studying them, because there are no academics I know of that is studying that culture from the perspective of the fact that they have these elongated skulls. And what's, you know, what's the origin of that? Um, Archaeologists admit that they have no idea where the Paracas culture came from. They just suddenly appeared hmm. out of nowhere and built this great culture. And then they were actually invaded by the Nazca people. And it's likely that the Nazca slaughtered the, um, the royal family that had elongated skulls, took over the land, and then continued building the, the line and geoglyph system. Well, recently there was... Um they're talking about finding skulls very similar to this, I believe, in Ecuador. So already there's a small group of scientists that have gotten together and said, that's impossible, that can't exist, that's a farce. What do you think about that? Oh, definitely. I've, I've seen photographs of them. Um, they extend all the way from Ecuador into Chile um, along this, this line called the Path of Viracocha. So, Almost all of the megalithic structures in Peru and Bolivia are lined up along this line called the Path of Viracocha, and that's also where we find the elongated skulls. More recently, um, elongated skulls have been discovered at Stonehenge in England. What? Wow. Yeah. Really? Yeah. And makes you wonder how they got there. Mm -hmm. Well, and also throughout Europe and into the Middle East, so it was a global phenomenon about, especially about 2,000 years ago, many royal families had these elongated skulls to make themselves look different from the general population. But my big question is, where does this idea come from? Is it possible that there were uh, people in the, in the past that were born with elongated skulls? And that's why 
we're planning on doing DNA testing and uh, working with physicians. I was going to ask you, with it being a skull, can you pull an accurate DNA test from the skulls itself? And ha has anybody in the past, which I think they would have, done any DNA testing and did it show anything kind of different or, or alien or something? Because <laughs> it does. When you look at the skulls, you're like, they, they couldn't be just human beings. And that's not a plate in their head either. No, it's not. Because I'm showing pictures as you're talking about it. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Uh, no, the, the thing is that academics 100% of the time say that um, every elongated skull is the result of, of head binding. Uh, because it was a ceremonial practice, but they, they won't ex go deeper than that, and that's why I've, I've done that. And no one has done uh, DNA testing. That's why I'm working with a, co a consortium of, of people, and we have two of the top labs on the planet that can do ancient DNA testing um, working with us on this. And when you do complete that, will you come back and share it with us, even if it's for a 15- or 20-minute little conversation? Yeah, I cannot believe that somebody in 2016 now has never done a DNA testing of this. I know. That's just it, it was, me. It's crazy. You know, it's, 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 it shows you how science tries to suppress things that it doesn't feel comfortable with, but that's too bad because this information <laughs> belongs to all 7 billion people on this planet. Exactly. Amen. It is like, why do so many people get stuck in these little boxes and they can't see anything outside of the boxes, even when there's physical evidence of it? Mm -hmm. I think it's healthy to be curious. I think we were born curious. Even before we entered these physical bodies, we were curious enough to come down here and explore this planet. And I'm exactly. Sure and I'm showing a picture of you actually holding a, a skull. And it's huge. It's huge. I mean, it's either not... you're very tiny or that's huge. <laughs> <laughs> and it, is it now holding? Because most people I see, scientists and stuff, they always wear protective gloves or something. Does does it make a difference of holding barehanded? Because I'm sure it's amazing by just holding it barehanded and, the and feeling energy. the energy of it. Yeah, it is, and uh, we are much more careful now with wearing gloves. But um, in order to do the DNA testing, they, you know, they they thoroughly sterilize the material before they break it down to get the actual DNA out. So um, we're also probably going to have access to a major collection of other elongated skulls too, which will be great, um, you know, to find out the truth behind who were these ancient Paracas people and why were they the ones who initiated the whole Nazca line set? Why did they make the astronaut who's waving, you know? I know that's why did they do all this work in, you know, in the most austere desert on the planet? It's, uh, it's beautiful, but it's very austere. It is. And we have two minutes left, Brian. I have two more questions, if you don't mind. The first one is, out of all 16 books that you've written and out of everything you've talked about on radio and television around the world, is there one or two little sound bites, little tidbits of something that you know that you've never put in a book and you've never talked about publicly that you could just tease us with for a second? Oh, you bet. I keep, uh, I keep I, I, you know, I give everybody a cappuccino, but I keep the cream on top, and that's for future reference. Well, then we will have you back for the cream. Yeah, yeah. Save okay. The cream for later. And out of all 16 of your books, tell us what couple of books do you feel like are the perfect titles right now to drive Tony's audience to read based on our conversation and interview today? Well, I would say my book on the Nazca lines, yes. um, because I go through every theory, and and I, you know, I think I come up with a, a logical timeline and reasoning behind why this work was done. And the other one is my lost ancient technology of Peru and Bolivia, because that shows you that Machu Picchu, or at least the core of it, is older than the Inca. The Inca discovered these ancient sites. Uh, they discovered Cusco as an abandoned megalithic city, and they went. I think we build our capital here because, you know, the gods lived here. And that's why Cusco became, that's why also why Cusco has the energy because it's thousands upon thousands of years old. What? It is, you know, it is Atlantean if you want to put it that way. It's, wow. it's of that vintage. It's very, yeah. very ancient. 
And let me tell you, when we were up there and there were some of the towers that have now come down, one of the first things that we figured out and through our guide too is how that tower could connect to aspects of Atlantis, aspects of Egypt, aspects of different parts of the world. That's Fascinating. remarkable. Fascinating. Yeah, it's it's part of the of the worldwide grid system. Well, my my two quick questions are: with the uh, climate changing, is it is it going to affect the Nazca lines and Palpa lines? Is it going to erase what's been there for thousands of years? Well, I hope not. Once in a while, there's a flash flood um, that can da has damaged some, but people have to understand that the Nazca system is hundreds of square miles. I mean, it's huge, right. um, and actually. What's been going on here recently is more drying than um, increased rainfall. And last one before we go, do you have any tours? Because you know your website hid, hidden uh, incatours .com. Do you have any tours that people can check out? That's right. And maybe go with yourself, or are you promoting any any other tours coming up soon? You bet. I'll be with Stephen Mailer next, or actually not next month in April in Egypt. We'll be looking at the. Lost ancient technology aspects as well as well as the spiritual aspects because the, the ancient sites um, are spiritual in nature, but they're also curious in terms of um, being technically almost impossible to construct. And then also we have a, a lost ancient technology tour of Peru in July, July, and those are the two big ones coming up. Well, one of these days, Eddie and I were going to go have to go with you oh, too. Oh, yes, you have to. Yes, yeah, we will. <laughs> All right, unfortunately, our time is up, and I can't believe how fast it's gone. And, Brian, again, you have blown, our, blown yeah, us away. We are baffled, like, believe, saying, I can't believe this man knows this, <laughs> this much information. But we want to thank you so much for being here, and please come back again anytime uh, you have something to promote and uh, any new information that might shock the hell out of the, this world that needs it. So, uh, But thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Brian. Always an honor, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank, thank you. All right, everybody, Brian Forrester, go to HiddenIncasTours.com, and uh, we're going to go ahead and say goodbye. But if you guys uh, want to uh, check out our YouTube channel, this will be up on our YouTube channel, and we are going to have this video up probably tonight or tomorrow because you don't want to miss this nope. one. And uh, you can listen to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, and now on iHeartRadio. We want to thank you guys for supporting us. Go to TruthBeToldWebTV.com. And uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we have Stephen Mailer on the phone. So be right back on our, on our Tony Sweet. Truth Be Told with Tony and Eddie. I'm Tony Sweet. I'm Eddie Connor, and thanks, Brian Forrester, for being with us. Pleasure. All right. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Great. Thank you.